Good evening, everyone. This is Shane Gebauer with Brushy Mountain Bee Farm. I'm the general manager here. I'd like to welcome you all this evening to Backyard Queen Rearing. Uh, tonight, we have the honor of being with Larry Connor, uh, Dr. Larry Connor. He is uh, someone that is really well respected in this area. Uh, he travels all over the country speaking on the topic, and I guess actually the world. Uh, he's been outside the country uh, speaking with groups. He offers classes uh, on his farm uh, up in Michigan, uh, and as I mentioned, travels around the country teaching. He organizes the Sideliner uh, course uh, with the American Beekeeping Federation every year. He's written numerous books, which... Um, I know that uh, I'm sure he'll be mentioning, but I'll give a shameless plug on his behalf. Uh, the latest is uh, Queen Rearing Essentials, which is an absolutely fabulous book. Uh, there's lots of other topics that are sort associated. He, oh, I thought you were going to advance to a picture of it there. For, there it is, Queen Rearing Essentials. It's a wonderful book. goes uh, into great detail, has a lot of good illustrations and pictures in it, uh, color pictures. It's a really good book if you're interested in doing queen rearing. Um, and, you know, and, and queen rearing, I think, is one of those things that you can really immerse yourself in and get, and perhaps if you're just getting started, get bogged down in some of the minutia of it. And I think this book does a really great job of providing the necessary information without uh, bogging people down. Um, so if you don't have a copy, it's, a, it's an excellent resource to have. So I'll give him a shameless plug on, on, uh, on his behalf. There's also other books that he's got, uh, B-Sex Essentials. Uh, that would certainly be related. Uh, increase essentials, which deals with making splits and nukes and stuff. And, and whoa, look at that. Um, <laughs> and uh, and so the, these are great resources. Uh, so so there's our, our shameless plug uh, for these books. But um, I'll consider that uh, payment in lieu of uh, monetary compensation because he's volunteering his time with us here this evening. So thank you very much, Larry. I appreciate you spending the next hour or so with us. Um, before we get started and before I turn it over to Larry, um, we just have a, a few poll questions that we want to um, offer up to you all. Um, and the first one is basically, um, have, you, have you reared queens before? So I'm going to go ahead and launch this poll. And if you could go ahead and um, just make your selection, uh, if you've raised queens before, I've got uh, a little over 60%, almost 70% of you voting. I'm going to go ahead and close the poll in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Last chance, and we'll close that poll. And just so that um, everyone can see, uh, we've got 85% of you that have not been, done any uh, uh, queen rearing. So hopefully by the end of our discussion this evening, You'll be way on your, you'll be well on your way to uh, to starting off. Um, I'm going to go ahead and and hide those results now, and I'll ask my second question, which um, uh, I, I'm afraid to, of what the response will be here. But basically, uh, would you be interested in a follow up webinar focusing on producing nukes for your own, from your own? Oh, that's supposed to be from your own stock for overwintering purposes. So if you could go ahead and um, respond to that. Um, we've got uh, a little over 70%. I'll go ahead and close this in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And I'm going to go ahead and close that poll and I'll share the results with you. Uh, Larry, I, I think you're going to be coming back with us uh, later on this year, maybe in a few months, to discuss producing nukes for overwintering purposes. Um, so since you asked me to uh, pose that uh, question to the folks attending this evening, it looks like you volunteered yourself. Um, so, so uh, oops, there we go. So let me go ahead and hide that now. And um, Larry, with, with that, um, I'll just say I really do appreciate you taking some time out of a very busy schedule during a very busy time of year to join us this evening and share uh, the wonderful information that you've got stored up there uh, in your head uh, so that we can all benefit. Because I think queen rearing, backyard queen rearing especially, for the, on a small scale is something that can greatly improve the industry. So I really do appreciate you being here this evening. And uh, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Shane. Appreciate it. 
I've got um, a number of things to talk about this evening, and I appreciate the fact that many of you have not raised queens before. Um, that's me grafting in one of my classes or demonstrating grafting. And uh, I have classes, and I'll mention that later, where they, some of them are coming up this uh, spring and summer. Uh, we've already had the shameless plug. Um, the cream ring book is basically, we're going to see some of the same images tonight that are in the book. And my focus here has been to come up with something that's very simplified right there in the name essentials. Um, I haven't put in 1,050 different versions of Racing Queens. I just have one, and we'll get into that. The B-Sex book, of course, as it implies, talks about uh, queen and drone production and reproduction, their, their mating, and also a little bit on uh, bee breeding. Uh, so far, the uh, best-selling has, has been this increase essentials because it deals with making nukes, summer nukes, and everybody wants to get free bees. Uh, or at least bees from their own operation. This book by GM Doolittle was a reprint. Uh, Doolittle was an upstate New York uh, beekeeper, um, not of the last uh, century, but the century before that, and into the last century. And he wrote this book in 1889, Scientific Queen Rearing. And that's the basis for the entire um, queen rearing process that we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, he did not, have, have, however, have plastic uh, cell cups. And uh, I've got a copy of this book up uh, by Laidlaw and Page, uh, Harry Laidlaw, who is no longer with us. Um, he wrote this last edition in his late 80s, and uh, uh, Dr. Rob Page uh, of University of California uh, in Davis and now in Arizona as a dean there. Um, this book has been uh, very popular, but uh, Rob Page had the right to um, uh, call the book back in, so we just have a few copies of this left, and uh, it's not back out in the trade very much. So, uh, just to comment here about where to get a hold of me and um, how some of these things are done, you can go to my website, uh, www.wickwas, that's W-I-C-W-A-S, a lot of people want to put a K in there, there is no, no K in Wickwas, or send an email to me at my email address. Larry, uh, so let's talk about queens and drones and getting Larry, set up for the. Uh, uh, Larry, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I'm just getting a couple of comments here about uh, about the volume. I've I've muted myself to try and help with that, except for right now, of course. But um, if if you could uh, maybe just uh, speak a little louder, or, or maybe that uh, increase yeah, in the, the volume would uh, the well. Mic. Well, uh, let everybody determine if this works because this is with my mic uh, nearly all the way up. Any feedback? No one writing in just yet. So I guess I guess we'll. Uh, oh, there's someone okay for me. Sounds good to me. Sound is fine. So I guess I guess we're good now. All right. Good. Good. Sorry. Sorry. We didn't have that set up, but we were trying to avoid feedback. All right. Let's talk about queens a little bit and raising a few of our own. Uh, the queen serves at uh, the the pleasure, if you will, of the bees. She has a couple of main functions. Her, she's a chemical control center, and she is responsible for laying 99.99% of the, the eggs that are produced inside that hive. Uh, bees go through a development, and queens are bees, so they go through a development too. And working the colonies right now here in North America, or wherever you are in the northern hemisphere, you're probably seeing an increase in the number of queen cups. Um, and a queen cup is defined as a, a structure that looks like this little teacup that's upside down that does not have an egg, a larvae, or anything else in it. Once there's an egg or a, a larvae in there, it becomes a queen cell. <clears throat> as the bees work, work uh, the season, these are potential swarm cells, and they're going to be at the bottom of the frames. We're looking up at the bottom. and as the bees start to anticipate uh, the queen coming in and depositing an egg in these queen cups, they will add wax, and there will be a thin layer of uh, wax here. So uh, queen cups like this, you'd say, okay, we have to watch this colony carefully because in the next few days, the queen's probably going to be in there and laying eggs. And it's with three days of uh, the egg stage, 
in five and a half days at the pupil stage, uh, you're just a little over a week away from the possibility of this colony swarming. So it's one of those things that we have to keep uh, good, close uh, attention to. Queens, of course, um, develop in these cells, and sometimes described as peanut-like uh, uh, cells. And you can see that this cell, and it looks like there may be another uh, cup being developed in the, behind it. Uh, put my pointer, this, of course, is the queen cell. And this is the potential cup, or the, the cup that is a potential queen cell. And as bees uh, produce these in nature, they'll find a spot on the comb where there's availability. And a lot of beekeepers just stereotype them if they're on the face of the comb. They're supersedure uh, cells, which means that that cell will be used to replace the old queen. And if they're the bottom of the cell, uh, the frame, I mean, then they're going to be swarm cells. It would be nice if Mother Nature cooperated, but that's sometimes they, go, they have multi-source sort of uh, when it was a supersedure. What we call a supersedure may become a swarm cell and vice versa. When queens are deposited, and this is a, a wood cell base. You can buy it from uh, the Kelly Company. I don't know if you've got them there, Shane, at uh, Brushy Mountain, but uh, it's a wood cell base with a wax cell, the old-fashioned way. And this larvae was grafted in uh, a day before. And what you see here, this white material, is royal jelly. And the key to good queen rearing is a surplus of this royal jelly. Uh, it's secreted by the hypopharyngeal glands of the uh, worker bees. To produce that, they have to eat both honey and pollen, or your pollen substitute. And without the honey and pollen, they don't produce very much. And that's a key part of what we're going to be talking about in terms of our queen rearing. And so we want our cells filled with a lot of royal jelly. Now here's a half a dozen queen cells that look pretty good. And if you look carefully here, these are the plastic cells, the JZBZ cells, um, I'm selling cells, I guess. But these are the queen cups that you then graft into. And you notice these here have a whitish material, these four in the center, if you will. And that is royal jelly, and that's surplus royal jelly. Part of it is surplus. Part of it is these are cells that have just been sealed. So the late larvae is in here. The, of course, the worker bees do all the sealing. And just before the uh, larvae inside this cell is finished, uh, its metamorphosis It's going to feed on this royal jelly, uh, straighten out. Uh, spin a cocoon, and then go ahead and convert the, the metamorphosis from the larval stage to the pre pupae stage, and then the pupae, and then eventually the adult. I like these cells because you can cheat. You can look at them and, and see what's going on, and you, you have a good idea. This is feedback for you as a beekeeper when you start raising queens. So. What are the steps to produce backyard or, or small-scale uh, operation? The first colony we're going to talk about is what I call the starter colony. This is in the book. And uh, these are, by the way, not my ideas either. These are things that have gone back through uh, Marla Spivak in uh, Minnesota and her entomologist, uh, uh, Gary Reuter. And that goes back to Steve Tabor at uh, Tucson. And I have no idea where he borrowed this information from. And the starter colony is a fairly simple colony. It's a could be a five, four frame nuke, whatever you've got, and it's confined. The bees are not able to fly. If you look very carefully here, this this looks like window screen because it is window screen. We have a screen bottom on this five frame nuke, and while this has a potential feed spot, we're not feeding because we're going to give the bees the feed they need on frames of uh, a comb. So the basic uh, work of setting up a starter is going into a good strong colony and finding the queen. Well, of course, some people have nightmares over that. And uh, uh, you can uh, put the queen excluders on so you can narrow down where the queen is and which box and by looking for eggs and larvae after four days, five days, and you can tell where the uh, uh, queen is and is not. But we want those bees. We don't want the brood. We don't want the queen. We just want the bees. We want those young nurse bees 
that are on those frames, and these are brood frames, there's seven of them there that have brood on them. And we're going to shape those bees into a, this box, and here's one I made out of a, a cardboard box, so there's no, uh, no one thing you can do here. Here's one of those uh, five frame uh, cardboard sh uh, nuke shipping boxes. And you can see I just cut a hole there and uh, put some window screen on for ventilation. Now, the secret to this is that we're before we shake the bees in here, we put in a couple of uh, small sponges, clean sponges, or a wet towel. And they're soaked in water, so that they're just dripping with water. So this is important for the starter to have a good, clean water source inside the box, because again, they're not going to fly. We've also added a frame of, uh, or maybe two frames, with honey and pollen on them, or one of each. And sometimes we take the honey frame and we scratch it with our hive tool, so it encourages the bees to engorge on that honey. And then a third frame, uh, if you're using a five-frame nuke, just for a place to cluster. So if you have another frame of pollen, another frame of honey, or an empty frame, you can do that. So we're shaking this frame that we've checked for the queen. The queen is somewhere else. She may be in a, a box. She may be back here already in the hive. And we're going to try to shake all the bees we can out of one colony, no more, just one colony into a box. And the older bees are going to fly back, and, and you say, have a nice flight. And the young bees, the young nurse bees, are going to stay behind. And here we're shaking, and we're shaking. And you look down, you see a couple of inches of nurse bees in the bottom of this, and that's what you want. You want uh, these frames of food. I'm not showing you the sponge. I, sorry, I don't have a good picture of that. And I don't know why I don't have that. It's probably the key thing. Um, but you've got the water, and you've got carbohydrates in the honey, and you've got protein in the pollen, and that's what you need to make a queen. And these bees are now queenless. And we here, here we, a few drones get in there, that's okay. I see drone brood just to remind me. You might get some drones in there. They won't get in the way, but of course, drones aren't going to help you with the queen room. So then you can uh, put the frames back and put the cover on. If you're going to graft from the very same uh, colony you um, have shaken bees from, you don't want to shake the frame that you're grafting from. You want to brush the bees off. And the reason for that is that shaking process can dislodge those larvae just a little bit so they're not in the center of the, of the cell, which is going to make it harder for you. I don't think there's any damage. I've never seen any evidence of damage by shaking the food, but certainly when you go graft for them in there, kind of in the corners of the center, it makes it a bit of a challenge. And you can sunk the bees uh, down and put the lid on. Uh, if you have a bee brush, you can brush them if they're on the side. Uh, they always seem to be where you don't want them. And now this box can stay out in the bee yard if it's warm. Uh, we've been having temperatures down in the 30s the last couple of nights, so it, we can either tuck it in between a couple of hives or take it into a garage or a building. Uh, the old joke in South Florida is you put in the bed with your wife. Um, I don't think most people's relationships survive that. So here we are. Uh, bees are inside. Uh, this beekeeper, uh, Raleigh Hannon in Connecticut, he uh, sets them in uh, his uh, in a building. This is just like a mudroom in a in a house, and because we have screen on the bottom, we have put a uh, set the bees on something. So there's ventilation, but there's no flight, and you've got a, a closed system, and this system is using the emergency response that the bees have. They're queenless and they're broodless, so they're going to take very good care of the larvae that you we're going to put in here in the next stage. So here we are putting the larvae in uh, that we, we're going to graft, and we'll go through that here in just a minute in fairly great detail. And as I said, the easy way to put the graft in is to simply lift the box off the ground a couple of inches and drop it, and the bees fall off the comb. And they're not in the air, they're not in your face, and you can put the graft in and very gently ease it down into that mass of bees so that um, you don't crush any bees. And the bees, of course, they'll crawl right back up. And um, they probably think, uh, I don't think they think, they just probably don't appreciate it very much. 
So the transferal process is, uh, we call it grafting. Uh, Doolittle, uh, GM Doolittle, who came up with the system, only mentions the word grafting in his book, Scientific Clindering, once, and that was regarding fruit trees. He called the, referred to it as the transferal or transference of the larvae from a worker's cell to a cotton, a wax cup, and we can use wax or plastic. As you select a stock for grafting, that's the whole talk in its own right, Jane, and everyone else. Uh, you know, your, your whole approach. Let me tell you what I'm doing this year. I've got some colonies that survived the winter. Last year we obtained some uh, uh, nukes from a beekeeper in Indiana and in Michigan uh, who had stock from Greg Hunt's program at Purdue. Uh, these bees have some resistance to varroa mites, but they're not, you know, so-called hygienic. They probably have several traits present. And because they were queens that were 50 percent uh, Purdue and 50% whatever drones this beekeeper had, um, we had a lot of variation in the outcome of those nukes. And some didn't do very well and are no longer with us, and some are just booming. Now, that's not what we see here. But I'm using those colonies as grafting stock this spring. We started on April 1st, April Fool's Day, with the first graft. Got one qu uh, queen out of the deal, but since then we've done a number of grafts and we've got some queen cells of production. And we're slowly starting to make up a few nukes, a few increased colonies um, that will also serve as mating nukes. So the thing we're looking for here is here's a frame of, of uh, shield brood, but we want to look on the edges and see if there's the right age larvae. And we'll get to that, what you're looking for in just a second. And some people will confine the queen so she's not able to, uh, uh, she has to lay on just one frame for a specific time period and then come back when those larvae are right, uh, are ready for grafting. I don't think we need to worry about that too much, but it does help if we have a pretty good idea what the queen is on there. So we're looking for larvae that are, and you see you've got that normal gradient. You've got some pollen up here. There's probably pollen over here and some honey. And maybe a few eggs. There's an egg, and there's an egg. And then you've got some small larvae, and you see the larvae get larger. So you're going to be looking in this area right here for the larvae that you want to select out of those cell cells. Now, some of you are already screaming, say, I can't do that. And my response is, uh, well, get a kid to do it for you. Find some 16-year-old football player or uh, soccer player or somebody who knows how to throw and catch a ball and hire them to do your drafting. And I think it's a great system to get younger people involved. Now here's a close-up of what we're looking at, and you can see, if you look closely here, look at this larvae. It, just, it looks like an egg that just laid down, and by golly, that's about what it is. There's no feeding here. And while the calendar would say this is the optimum for you to select, you're better off than finding a larvae that's just a little bit older that's been fed royal jelly. And you can see the royal jelly that starts to puddle up here. and uh, you know, these are, I think everything here that's not an egg is graftable, but you'll find that grafting something that's still that dry is going to be a challenge, plus some of those who are uh, visually impaired uh, won't see it anyway, so you'll skip it. Uh, the old timers, and I, including myself, used the phrase milk brood, where you can go into a frame and uh, you see all the brood that's here. It, that's listening, it looks like somebody spilled a little milk in it. That's all the royal jelly, and it's characteristically surrounded by pollen, where the bees have been eating the pollen as they move into this area, and now you've got some material that's probably the right bees for grafting. So again, we can go in here and pick some out. Now, is there anything in here that's too large? Well, maybe this one right here, and maybe this one here, just a little bit too large. But you know what, if you don't go any bigger than that, I'm not going to worry about it because they'll stir, still turn into queens that could be very, uh, very productive. In the grafting process, you can do what's called a wet graft uh, and prime the cells with royal jelly, either pure royal jelly that you've uh, uh, collected from swarm cells and uh, it's fresh and you've taken the larvae out and you can 
mix that up, or you can dry graft and not mess with this at all. I've done both, and I seem to have fairly good luck with both, but I think I, this is my 34th year raising weeds, so you know I have a little more experience than 85% than of you have. So uh, you do have to learn these things. Now this is back at Raleigh's operation in Connecticut. He has this very fancy system for priming the cells. He takes half of the royal jelly out, and he mixes about an equal amount of water, tap water, um, room temperature, and he mixes it up with this fancy device. It's actually a galvanized nail. And he puts a drop of royal jelly at the, bro the bottom of each of these uh, plastic cups. Yeah, you, you can use any grafting system you want. I like and do use the uh, JCBZ cell cups. Uh, they're affordable, they're predictable, and uh, the hinge here, if you will, this, this platform, that will push into a frame of brood when you go to introduce it. So, you know, everything's there that I need for a very simple system of queen ring. So here's a little putty, puddle of royal jelly. In my book on queen ring essentials, uh, the last chapter is a, a visit with uh, uh, Dave Mixon down in Groveland, Florida. And Dave uses pure royal jelly, and he uses an eyedropper, and he literally fills the entire bottom with the pure organic royal jelly. He spends a lot of money to get it in, uh, but it is, in his opinion, worth the effort. Um, so here you have the, that galvanized nail dropping the, putting the drop in, and uh, putting the royal jelly in. See the little drop there that's on this. And the different uh, colors of uh, cell cups. Uh, can represent different breeder queens, whatever you uh, have in your operation. You could have uh, up to, I think the JCBC has six different colors, so you could have six different breeder queens, and just leave the cell cups in there, and you know what breeder queen they're from. You don't have to keep a lot of records. Now we get a grafting tool, and I'll show you a couple of these. This is a stainless steel grafting tool that uh, Raleigh has. And you can see that there's a larvae on there, and she's uh, C-shaped. And we come in from the, the side here, so the, the closed end of that C, so you can get that. Well, you see this fluid here that's on there? He's removing the royal jelly from the cell, and he's going to put it down into this cup. And, and the royal jelly is going to help remove it. And so you, you have an advantage there. These are some of the Chinese grafting tools. I think they use a bamboo. Uh, material for the, the actual plunger. And, you know, I ended up this spring remaking something out of an old uh, woods dowel and filing it down, and it's working better for me this year. Last year I used metal, the years before I used a toothpick. Whatever works, it doesn't damage the larvae. And the bees will tell you if you damage the larvae because they'll reject them. So you can see that this is a stainless steel tool. These, these are made um, in uh, Germany by a dental supply company. There are also plastic versions of these, and also I think within disposable dental supply company. So I don't have any strong recommendation except find one that works for you. Here's uh, looks like the larvae is sort of on the, the edge there, so you got just the head or tail end of the larvae. And as you can see, if you just lower that down and put it in, uh, you can just, uh, the, the royal jelly at the bottom of the cup, or the dry cell, and just uh, hold that in there, and uh, the larvae will come right off. So he says. And as you work along, uh, having good lighting, if you're outside, use the sun to your back. And if you're inside, uh, floodlights, work lights, uh, big old-fashioned living room light with all the lights turned on, Whatever it takes to get some good light in there and uh, helps you with your vision. So these just show you different ages of larvae. And notice how uh, they've been picked up so that there's something hanging out that's going to come off the bottom of the cell. And here you can see you put the cell down into the jelly. I think the next one will show you pulling it away. Well, it's over here. It's where it's being pulled away. And that just shows the larvae on the, uh, the end of the cell. I think I can zoom in a little bit here. Uh, without losing, it's going to get really fuzzy. 
So that's about uh, an ideal C. You see, it's a nice C shape, and uh, there's a little fluid here from the cell. And notice this hive tool, this grafting tool. If you've tried it before, you notice that's been worked on. It's probably been ground down a little bit and then carefully sanded and then carefully polished. Because the last thing you want on this uh, grafting tool is anything sharp that will damage the larvae. Let me skip through these. Okay. One of the questions that beekeepers often uh, uh, overlook is uh, timing, and especially uh, uh, the month of April in uh, the north, I'm in Michigan, uh, we have a real good question. Do we have drones that are going to be at the right age for the graft we want to make? In other words, you can get started too early. And so when nice grafts are done the 1st of April, we didn't see any drone brood. Uh, we did find some in other colonies, so that was reassuring, and we only ended up with one queen out of that graft anyway. But the general rule is to graft the 24-hour uh, larvae that we just showed you at a point where you have drone brood that has been sealed for at least five days. And you say, well, Dr. Connor, how do I know I've got that? Well, go into a colony and, whoops, we want... We want purple-eyed larvae, uh, pupae, pupae. So these are uh, the drone pupae, and they, their eyes are purple in color, and you can see that here. And uh, actually, just part of the eye is, is turned, because this is the whole eye from here to here on that drone. And all I'm doing here is just giving you something visual to help you remember that you have to have drones in production if you're going to produce queens, because otherwise you're going to have some uh, queens that go out to mate, and the only drones you're going to find are somebody else's, or uh, they won't find any at all. Once we've grafted, these are these sticks here. Are, um, you probably just take some um, bottom bars and cut them down to fit. And then, uh, because many of these now have the groove in there that this plastic cup fits in, you can also use the the wood cell bases and the um, wax cups. They work very well, but you have to use hot wax, obviously, to fasten them onto the bar. Either way, and we're now going to put wax, we are putting wax on these just to secure them down a little bit better, because sometimes they fall off, and it's just sloppy, so a little wax on there uh, is very helpful. This is a, a, a cell frame, and we've got a wider cut here. You can use a regular um, end bar and make this cut out. You can buy them from uh, Brushy Mountain and other people. And here we've got two bars. So we've got two, four, and then we have two more here. We'll end up with six on this. Very carefully putting them in, trying not to bump them in any way. And then uh, these will go out into the starter colony. Here's another system. You, you find, you know, a thousand and one variations on this. And uh, you can use any of them here. I just wanted to point out one other thing in terms of spacing. I like the cells to touch. I don't see any real value in having spread out here. Uh, if you have just, what do we got, seven cells, I'd put them in the center so they're right against the brood when we get into the cell finisher colony in just a minute here. So here's a starter colony we made up at a class we taught in Texas, the low Texas beekeepers. And uh, they have been in here overnight in this starter colony. So we are, we're setting up the starter. Uh, we could do it tonight. Tonight is, what, the 20th? And we can uh, set up a starter. Uh, if you're just getting home on the West Coast, you can uh, do this after the program. Set up your starter, have a snack, and go out and graft, and put the graft in. And tomorrow, sometime tomorrow, in the morning, the noon, the night, you can take those cells out and um, they're going to look something like this. They're going to have bees covering, and you see the cells here. And the ones that have been taken are going to have a small amount of wax added to them, what I call the little volcano. And if you look inside that cell very carefully, you'll see there's royal jelly there and a larvae floating on top. So here's another starter system. You see, we have no standards in terms of the starters. And whatever works, uh, we're, we're happy to have them. So this brings us to the finisher colony also called the cell builder. Now, there are systems out there that you can use the same colony as a starter and a finisher, 
And once you get some experience, I encourage you to try some. But for this program, I'm just talking about a very simple starter and a very simple finisher. Here are some cell finishers or cell builders, again in Connecticut. And you've got, uh, these are typical of your setup. And you've got a queen here, a queen excluder. And brood, you put above. And that's where the queen cells are going to go. So here's another one. Queen below, queen excluder, and, and brood above. And you can have the same thing here. Uh, this may be the queen excluder right there. I'm not sure this one has one. Looks like an excluder there. There may be a box of supers. Whatever is being done in that daycare. You can never second guess a beekeeper. Looking down into a cell finisher, we see the queen excluder. And then we want to have, now our starter had no brood. The finisher has brood. And what we're doing is we're creating part of the hive that is uh, the queen doesn't have access to. And by doing that, we are reducing the queen's pheromone level in that particular area of the hive of the colony. And those bees are going to respond to those started queen cells as if nothing ever happened. Oh, well, we're, we're, we're making queen cells. OK, great. Let's, let's feed them. And so the bees that are going to say, let's feed them, are going to be nurse bees. So to get the nurse bees to go through that cleaning scooter, we put open brood, eggs and larvae above the cleaning scooter. And at least this frame right here, and this frame, and the cell, the cells will go in the middle. And then everything here will be pushed together, or we can add more frames on the outside. And I like to have these lighter frames, might be frames of honey and pollen. And we can have more brood up here. We don't have to have just two frames. We might have four or five. And uh, generally, um, I was talking to someone today, you know, your, your finisher colonies need to be boiling with bees. This is not. This is a colony that's uh, not even come to a simmer yet in terms of bee population. But this is typical of what you're going to see early in the year if you try to force things. Uh, Here's a medium depth uh, a finisher type colony here, queen cells. And you just have to keep the brood up there so that you don't have an issue with the bees getting too old and not feeding those uh, cells. Here's a commercial cell finishing setup at uh, uh, Conan's in California. Uh, and these are, you talk about boiling with bees, if the bees are boiling out of the hives, literally. Uh, this is early March month and a half earlier than what we are right now. And they've got uh, feeder containers here that go through the lid. And then you've got, uh, I assume the queen's excluder is right here. And then an em empty shell, maybe just to catch any extra syrup and honey that the bees collect. Because you can gum up the works very carefully, very quickly. Here's a cell finisher that we used last year in other beekeepers' hives. And uh, I know that the way I like to set them up, and we've got two frames of brood here, two frames of brood here, honey and pollen, and honey and pollen. And then when the graft is ready coming out of the starter colony, we can put it right here in the middle. But we could also put one here and one here. So we could have three uh, bars in there, uh, or three, excuse me, three frames, but I, I tend not to like to put that many in. Um, I like to see uh, maybe... Uh, Oh, 30 cells going into a cell finisher, even though uh, this month we've been putting more than that in some of them. But break them up. If you can make more, more finishers, you can get the, the cells started in the starter colony. It's hard to get them to, to cooperate in that finisher sometimes. Here is what uh, well, you see right in the Jay-Z species sometimes. Um, and here's the Royal Jelly. And this is... 48 hours after we grabbed it. So the larvae that's inside, I'm sorry I don't have a shot of that larvae, is now at the end of her third day because she was roughly one day old when we grabbed it. And now 48 hours after grafting, we've got three days. So this larvae is about uh, a little past the halfway mark because um, at three days, the uh, developmental time for queens is about five, five and a half days. So the cells are nearly finished. You see the white? That's new wax that's being produced. You might even see some bees that are chewing on this, and they're adding wax to it. And this is, this is all very normal. Of course, we had to brush the bees off, and they're waiting to get back to their cells because they're being very attentive to those queen cells. 
Some of the bees on those cell bars are feeding the larvae. Some are secreting wax. Some are forming the cells. And some are probably just taking the temperature to make sure they're not too hot or too cold. So there's a lot of activity on those cell bars when you, when you work in there. One of the things that uh, we do with our classes is we can always uh, mark them and we know whose are whose. Uh, and then you start doing multiple graphs. You want to either have a date that you graphed it uh, and or a, a, a graph number for the year if you're going to do a number of them. Uh, and you can also put down the, the breeder queen that you've used, the queen that you've selected. So here's, uh, I think this is the same shot as the cover of the book, but you see these queen cells that are being produced. These are some of uh, uh, Dave Mixes down in Florida. They're nice long cells. They're well fed. He dips the entire bar and the cells in hot wax, so there's lots of wax for the bees to use to make queen cells because beekeepers, although they hate to admit it, are all size queens. They want big queen cells. Uh, actually, it's the amount of royal jelly that's in the cell is more important than the size of the cell. But we all like big queen cells. Uh, but this shows a pretty good coverage, and this is what you want. These bees are busy making queen cells. They're in a queenless area of the hive, and they have brood available to them, and of course, they're able to fly. Now, bees give beekeepers a test. I plugged one last week. I missed a day. I went out on the 11th day to to do something to queen cells, and then forgot I was a day late. And because at 10 days after you graft, so you graft on uh, a Sunday, the, not the next, the Wednesday of this week, but the Wednesday of next week, those cells are going to be ripe and ready for use. So they can either be put into a, a mating hoop, they can be put into your increased colonies. Uh, in this case, uh, Dave Mix is preparing them for pickup by beekeepers uh, or shipment to uh, beekeepers. You can uh, ship queen cells. And all of these things are going on here, but you just have to make sure that there's not a precocious virgin that gets out and then you should just go through and destroy all of your sisters. Um, and so there is a cell protector, a little cage you can put these queen cells into for shipping and various other systems, which you know, work out fairly nicely. Uh, but on the 11th, starting on the 11th day after grafting, so you've got uh, three days is the larvae plus uh, 11. That's uh, 14 days. You start getting graft emergence on the late 14th, early 15th day, and uh, this gets into some problems. Because they'll get out there and do damage. Oops, wrong way. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on drone production uh, unless uh, we have time, which we might. But I think, Shane, I think we probably ought to throw it open to questions. Um, we've got uh, we've got several here um, that have come in. Um, All right, let's take take here and, and kind of go back a slide and, or two. Go ahead. Um, the first um, our supersedure or swarming uh, queen cell eggs inferior to eggs laid in queen cell cups or grafted eggs. Supersedure cells are uh, cells that are produced by the queen, and they're going to be great. Uh, they're, uh, whether they're laid in, which I don't know if it's or converted by the bee into a, uh, uh, into a cell, they're, they're, going to be, they're going to be good. Of course, a swarm, a swarm queen egg, from the time the queen lays it, that egg is uh, destined to be a queen from the very start, where a supersedure, there may be some delay on that. Um, I don't have any evidence to show there's any difference in their quality. Uh, one of the things that people argue that you should produce, you should use uh, swarm cells, and I've done it, and I think it works out well. If you're a purist, you could always come back and replace those swarm cell queens uh, with something that you produce later in the season. Uh, certainly at this time of year when the swarming is starting to or already has taken over your colonies, you can remove frames of brood with queen cells on them and use them, and use them very effectively to make up new colonies. Next question. 
this is a good one, I think. It opens up uh, a whole discussion on, on sort of genetic diversity and strains of bees. And the question specifically is, if you raise queens in a small operation, say 15 to 20 hives, would you expect to lose the strain of bees you're working with as the queens mate with drones outside the apiary? Absolutely. Uh, with, with small numbers of colonies, you know, I'd say under 50, unless you're in an isolated valley in Timbuktu, um, you know, there are people that try to use the valleys of Vermont and island systems in the Caribbean. I, I go for that one. Uh, and to try to have saturation of their drones, not somebody else's. Uh, I think in a good part of the this of North America, really, uh, and we'll include Mexico, Canada, and that, that we really do have an issue with uh, finding areas where we have good isolation. Uh, so a small beekeeper with 15 colonies has got to work very hard to uh, produce enough drones and then they, they have to be located in the perimeter of the uh, mating area. They need to be, say, a quarter to a half a mile away because uh, bees tend not to want to mate with their own, uh, their own brothers and sisters. So, and, so Larry, you, you, you're mentioning drones, and, and we've talked a lot about, about rearing the queens, the starters, the finishers, etc., what would what would you say would be a good number of colonies that are producing drones to uh, I guess essentially how many drones to mate with a queen? Um, I mean, obviously we know they mate with uh, you know around fourteen or so uh, drones, but how many do you need in the environment to sort of ensure that quality mating? And I want to follow up with this question by asking: Is losing that sort of uh, pure strain a bad thing? I think, uh, and I guess I'm, I might just start answering my own question here by saying that uh, a lot of times um, I get uh, I get questions about you know is it an Italian? Is it a Carniolan? And um, I, I think we get caught up in in trying to to have a pure strain rather than having a good quality strain. Uh, and for me, you know, you can get a great mutt. Buddy, I'm going to cut you off. Uh, first of all, color of bees. You can select color. You can take a queen and uh, turn her uh, uh, Italian by selecting only her yellow daughters. You could select the, just the dark daughters for carnial or uh, Caucasian. Our, uh, our, our bee industry, the commercial beekeepers want a, a yellow bee that produces a lot of brood. And so but unfortunately, they don't tend to be resistant to varroa mites, and they have other problems. They brood up a lot. Uh, by the way, we're looking at a frame of drone brood, so we'll get to that in just a second. The, uh, so color is um, not as much a factor in, in some of the selection that's been done with Minnesota and VHS and other uh, stocks have been more or less color blind. Uh, the problem is, and I know that I know I understand why. It's much easier to find a yellow queen on a comb than a black one, or a dark one, or a banded one, because they blend in better. They've got better camouflage. So you, you your choice is then, well, do I get a yellow stock or do I you know, mark every queen? Which is my answer. You mark the queens. Um, so you 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 know the 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 color thing is an issue. Now, Shane, you mentioned the diversity is issue that if you have a pure strain, and I want to know where you're getting this pure strain from, uh, my world, a pure strain would be an instrument, instrumentally inseminated queen from someone like Tom Glenn or Joe Lapshaw or Sue Covey who do this for a living. And then you are producing daughters from those uh, inseminated, uh, instrumentally inseminated breeder queens. That's the pure line. And then when they those daughters are produced and mate to your mutts in the neighborhood, uh, you've got a, a colony that's going to be 50% of whatever the, the grafting mother was and 50% of the drones from the neighborhood. And if the queen mates with 20 drones, roughly 1 20th of the bees are going to be from each drone. So that's where the diversity comes in. And, 
I know we've had you've had uh, Dave Tarpey on here talking about some of these things, and um, I mentioned Dave Tarpey in the book on the sex essentials. Um, it's a really interesting subject. I think that what we need to do, and I've written about this in both the American Bee Journal and uh, Bee Culture in the last couple of years, we need to look at an area-wide uh, breeding program where uh, you know Podunk County beekeepers all get together and if you've got more than four or five colonies you're going to cooperate and then the people that have less than that can get a free uh, queen every year or to every two years that produces the right kinds of drones. The other thing you can do and that's what this frame is here is drone saturation. You can start producing good drones, what I call target drones because they got a, their target is the queen or the, the, you know, maybe the other way around, the drones are target. And we can produce them just from those colonies that we really like, whether they're from a breeder queen like the uh, ones we just mentioned from uh, Sue Kobe and uh, Tom Glenn and uh, Joe Latshaw, or we've gone out and we've selected queens that we really like. The key here is not to let the other colonies produce drones, and there are several ways of doing that in drone management by harvesting those drones and um, with freezing them or uh, cutting them out with the, this plastic comb. You can just use a putty knife and scrape them out. It's a horrible mess, but some people's chickens like it a lot. My neighbor's chickens don't like these things very well. But you can take care of it and um, just select the drones that you want from your particular area. Uh, they might have some characteristics for wintering. They might have some other characteristics that adapt them well to your region. Uh, certainly if they have any microsystems, I'm interested in hearing about them. Uh, in the uh, B-Sex Essentials and a little bit in the other things that I write, I do talk about what's called a drone holding colony. And drone holding colonies are colonies where you basically take frames like these and these are the green frames from uh, Pierco. But then I, a lot of people sell these uh, drone combs, uh, just larger cells on the imprint, and you let the bees draw these out. And you can have one, two, or three of these frames in a colony starting now and going into uh, uh, the summer and even into the fall in some areas and stimulate drone production in those colonies you want. Now, if you've got 15 colonies, uh, you can produce a lot of drones here. Uh, the drone holding colony gives you one advantage. It takes the, the drone comb out of the colony and puts it into a, another a new unit. And for every drone frame you move, you have to move a frame of worker brood and the bees on it, holes for the bees on it. And then take a, a virgin queen and put her in a cage and keep her there and then feed these colonies. But the advantage is that you've now removed any Varroa mites that are in the colonies producing these. So they can produce more drones and the, uh, the, the Varroa mite population is going to skyrocket. This colony has got all the drones that you produce from several colonies and so you could use powdered sugar or just uh, uh, sample to see what kind of numbers you've got. When the drones have all matured and, and died happy drones when they made into queens, then you can take that old uh, virgin queen out uh, dispatcher and put a laying queen in here and now you've got a new colony of bees. Of course take the drone comb, uh, uh, the, the brood frames out uh, that are now empty. They might be filled with uh, uh, honey syrup because you're going to be feeding these colonies and then recycle them and put them back into your good colonies. So it's a little more work but it is one way of setting up an area and having a mating yard with say 50 to 100 queens uh, in production at any one point in time, and you could do that with 15 colonies. But then having drones in the neighborhood that are going to be a quarter to a half a mile around and trying to saturate that area with good drones. Now, if you get 25 beekeepers in your region that do the same thing, think about it, you're going to do quite a bit. So you don't have a lot of colonies, but everybody else uh, adds up to you know hundreds, maybe thousands of colonies all producing good drones. So that's that's my fantasy dream about bee breeding in uh, areas that we primarily have small-scale beekeepers. Did I answer all those questions there, Shane? Well, um, we've got uh, a, a 
couple of questions here that sort of can be grouped together. Um, you, you touched on this, um, but uh, I'm wondering if you can elaborate on it or, or explain it again um, about uh, collecting royal jelly for priming the, uh, the grafting cups. Um, and and ha that, that part's always been sort of a stumbling block for folks. Um, and, and then there's a follow-up from the same person that says that's sort of what's pushed uh, him toward using some of the queen-rearing systems like the NICOT. Uh, system that basically takes the grafting uh, p component of queen rearing out of it uh, and by using that system and also um, alleviates the need to sort of transfer so much royal jelly and, and deal with that. So I'm wondering if you can maybe elaborate on that a little bit and give us some pointers there. Well, I've used both systems of grafting and not uh, priming and not priming, priming with royal jelly. And uh, as I said earlier, they, they both are pretty well equal. The key thing when, you, when you're drafting is, especially when you're learning, things dry out. And so when you have larvae that are this small and you put them into a cell cup, they're going to dry out. So when we work, we work with some pretty well saturated towels, uh, saturated water, uh, not sweat, in case you're, you know, we work that hard, but almost. And uh, we keep these cells that we're working with um, covered. Okay, when we graft, we just pull it back and, and put the larvae in there and keep it covered. And then we keep that covered and we put it in the, as we put it in the, until we put it into the uh, starter box. Now, my argument that the reason we prime the cells is more to do with the uh, keeping the humidity up around the cell. But I know that it also helps to get the larvae off the cell. So, um, my response is that if you can't find a source of royal jelly, you dry graft. Um, that's not to say these other systems, and I know there are a number out there, uh, don't work. Um, I'll be very honest, I've never used one. So um, and I'm not really interested to because I've watched people use them, and I said, well, I can do that a whole lot faster uh, by using the grafting system. So, and I've taught. I tried to figure out how many people I've taught the last couple of years, two to three hundred beekeepers uh, clean rearing. So um, I know we I know we can do that, and I know where we've had trouble with the class uh, and the tape. It's almost always because um, things get dried out, and uh, you know we, of course, when you've got twenty people taking a class, somebody's slow. Um, you know, the, the larvae may be out of the colony for an hour or two, and that's probably uh, why the tape goes down. Um, these six bars that, uh, that we're showing here in uh, this system were probably uh, the entire graph took less than 20 minutes. But this is a beekeeper that's uh, raised a lot of queens over the years. I'm going to do another shameless plug. Um, queen rearing classes I'm teaching, I'm doing one in Connecticut in June. I've got uh, another one in June in Lansing, Michigan, and uh, just today agreed to do uh, four in Alberta, Canada, two in Edmonton, and two in Calgary. And we need to talk to Med Hat Nasser, the apiarist up there, the, the provincial apiarist. And then I'm ending the season with two classes at the farm, uh, one in June that will be a more advanced class. We actually want to go in and do some uh, hygienic testing with frozen brood. And the one in July, which will be more for new queen producers, much as uh, uh, people that are in this in the audience right now, and talk about making nukes and all the things that are involved there. Uh, this is all on my website at wickwas.com, and uh, the information is there, except for the Edmonton. I haven't uh, done anything with that yet. Um, okay. Can I answer that, those questions? Let's get away with another one. Yeah, yes, you did. Um, how, uh, how many days in the starter colony, um, how many days, I'm sorry, after how many days in the starter colony do we transfer the cells to the finisher colony? And, and then what do we do with the bees that remain in the starter? And, and uh, what, thank you for asking that question. The, the bees are going to be in that starter colony overnight. Whatever you define overnight as being, I would like to see at least 12 hours. A lot of people like 18 hours but somewhere in there, because the starters are good at starting, but they do a horrible job of finishing. 
So if they have, if you graph a hundred, or you know, uh, and you get eighty percent of them accepted, it's probably a good average. Um, if if you leave those cells in there, the numbers will go down every day, and you may end up with only five or ten percent. So the the closed starter is not a good way to finish the cells. So we leave them in overnight, and at that point they're now uh, in their fourth day and put them into the cell finisher where they're going to be there for another 10 days uh, when they're ripe and they're ready to be used, uh, however you want to use the cells. By the way, you can emerge queen cells in cages and uh, then use the virgin queens. Um, I'm surprised people don't use more virgin queens. I think they're a wonderful thing uh, because you can look at the queen. You can, you can select her color, that's for sure. Uh, you can select for her size. You can mark her. I don't want you to clip her wing because she still has to fly, but you can mark her so that you know that that's the queen that went out from that particular colony. I think that's it. Okay. There's a follow you mentioned the size of the queen. There's a question here. You know, as a rule, does a fatter queen mean a better queen? Can you can you gauge sort of her quality by looking at her? And uh, and I guess you know there's a there's I'll just before you answer that, I'll let you, you answer, but there's also a really great webinar that we did with uh, Dave Tarpey where he talks about queen quality and touches on sort of the size and, and the quality of a queen based on some work that he's done. But Larry, what do, what do you think? Is there some uh, validity to a bigger queen is a better queen? Yeah, I think uh, it helps to have a bigger queen, and I just pulled up this image of, this is out of Dave's anatomy book, you got to remember, a queen has got all these. It's got two ovaries filled with about 370 ovarioles at an optimal rate. Each ovarial is producing one or two or three eggs per day, and the eggs come down this tube. This tube, the median oviduct, come through here. This is the spermatheca where all the drones' sperm are stored. They come down this little tube, release the sperm that comes out to be laid. And the egg is laid uh, standing straight up. So well-reared queens have more ovarials, and uh, they're bigger queens. And so you get a lot of variation in size from a virgin queen that's going out to mate, and then she comes back, and her, her biochemistry clicks in, and she starts producing all these eggs. She becomes much larger. And of course, that's one of the things that happens during the swarming season, is the bees have to run the queen around the hive so she loses weight. They stop feeding her, they exercise her, and she doesn't lay as many eggs. So, yes, size is important, but it's very hard for especially new beekeepers to evaluate a queen because a queen in October is going to be a lot smaller than a queen hopefully will be in, uh, in May uh, because she's laying more eggs. Um, we, we've talked about uh, um, sort of the... the the ability of a colony to, to produce uh, good quality queens and, and of course uh, drones, being able to produce drones and things like that for, for adequate mating. Are there sort of some general parameters that you look for in the weather in terms of temperature, humidity, uh, things like that when you uh, decide when or when not to start your queen rearing? Uh, we basically were looking for some temperatures in the high 50s, low 60s, uh, and if you have a choice, not terribly windy, we've had some 35 to 45 mile an hour winds, which makes it really hard to work bees. Um, it's a lot more fun when the bees aren't uh, grouchy. I'm a lot more fun when I'm not grouchy, so I understand that as saw bees. Um, you uh, grouchy, Larry, never. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. And so I think I think you really have to be careful. And as I said about the drone maturation, that you can go out there and produce queens that don't have any drones to mate with. So we could have grafted in March. We had some nice days in March, a couple of them, not very many. Well, what's the point? Because if we then weaken colonies drastically to pull brood up from mating nukes, we didn't have any drones available, or certainly not enough drones that I knew of that would have mated with that queen or those queens. So 
you really have to follow the season and uh, if you want a biological indicator, I think you probably you probably want to start your queen rearing about the time the dandelions are in full bloom. Not the one or two token dandelions in your uh, side of the house, but right now here in Kalamazoo County in Michigan, uh, it's probably a good time to get started with queen rearing. We did start earlier, uh, but in terms of comfort and being able to produce good queens and having lots of drones, we're there now. We could have probably maybe a week earlier, but, you know, try to find some biological event that you can correlate with in your neighborhood. Uh, dandelions or forsythia or whatever is in bloom in your area that you can use to say, okay, um, certainly you don't want to do anything before the uh, maples in bloom, the soft maples. That's the very first thing that happens. Uh, here, that was in March. So, as I said, that was probably too early. So, there's a judgment call here. Shane? We've got uh, a couple of questions regarding uh, virgin queens and, and banking and things like that, specifically the virgins. Uh, how long um, can you keep them alive uh, in, until you need, keep them virgins essentially, I guess, until you need them? Um, yeah, and, yeah. And, and how long before you need, can you keep them caged before they go out and mate uh, and you release her? And then also, what do you think about banked queens? Um, I'm going to sort of assume those are, are mated uh, banked queens. What do, what do you think about the quality uh, of those? Uh, here's uh, a queen that's uh, laying normally. And uh, this is uh, from uh, Anita Collins, used to be at USDA, now retired. You see those ovaries, the ovarios. And when um, queens are banked, those reproductive structures, especially ovaries, shrink. And the exception to that is the colonies that are extremely well fed. So if you get a queen from a banked colony, you need to make sure she's fed well. Well, where's the best place to feed up a queen? In a cage inside a hive. And leave her cage in there for, you know, four to seven days, and then uh, let her get out. Don't let her get out right away. The same is true with virgin queens. You don't keep them confined as long. A lot of people think that, oh, she's a virgin. She just, you know, the bees don't think she's a queen. Well, you know, if you've ever had anybody who was a real princess in your life, you understand the fact that in their mind, they're queens. And in these bees' minds, they are queens. So you have to be very sensitive to that and introduce them. And the best way to introduce a virgin queen is to uh, put her into a small nuke, a mating nuke, and to leave her there for several days before you release her. Now, in many of the shipping cages you get or cages you make yourself, it may mean that you have to put a piece of duct tape or a little staple over the end of the cage, or if it's wood, staple, a duct tape for some of these plastic cages, and then come back in, you know, three or four days. Take that staple or duct tape uh, off, let the uh, bees in the, uh, uh, chew through the candy, the queen candy, and um, then you got a much better chance of that virgin being uh, accepted. Now, virgin queens on in nature, in a colony, if you set up any of these, if you put a queen cell in there, she's probably going to make some flights at, um, let's say, five to eight days, and those are orientation flights. But she's not going to go get involved in, with the, the business of mating and with sex until she's probably somewhere between the very early as seven days and as late as 18 days. But the commercial industry... You know, they're pulling queens out, some of them as early as 14 days. So she's probably finished mating at 11, 12 days, and a day or so to let her ovaries swell up and lay a few eggs and bang, she's in a cage and shipped off. Um, I like the people that are using uh, larger nukes uh, and uh, trying to let those queens do more development so that they are, uh, I was looking for a slide here, but I don't see it. But anyway, uh, leaving the queen in the nuke a little bit longer, uh, 20 to, to 30 days before you, you pull her out, because then all of her reproductive machinery is going to be in great shape. Uh, every hobby beekeeper, every small-scale backyard beekeeper should have a couple of nukes. Even your first year, Shannon, we're trying to double your production of nukes now, uh, because I do. really... 
need to have a nuke with an extra spare queen in the way bees are kept. And this is not a new thing. This is an old thing that old beekeepers, old school, um, school beekeepers would say, always keep uh, 10, maybe 20% of your county count in nukes. So if you've got 50 colonies, you'd have five or 10 nukes on hand with laying queens in there. And as you see a queen fail, you, you can use that nuke to requeen because there's, there's no loss of production when that queen fails because you're not spending, well, first of all, you're not letting them raise a queen, which is, you know, more than a month lost. Uh, and even if you have to go and buy a queen and install her and run the risk of losing her, um, then a laying queen right in the bee yard. And of course now, of course, if you've got a a, a, a nuke going in the summer, you just overwinter it. And uh, some of these uh, new ideas that have come out in the last uh, 200 years about wintering bees and nukes are pretty amazing to me. So I encourage people to do that. Next question. Uh, another question going back to royal jelly. Um, this person's wondering if they can um, harvest swarm cells as they come across them, uh, collect the royal jelly and freeze it for a period of time. And, and I guess I'll ask for clarification on how long they can freeze it and, and if that's a good thing. Um, and then also to sort of along the same lines of swarm cells, you touched on this a little bit, but there's a question about if you use uh, swarm cells uh, to rear queens, are you in fact selecting for that swarming behavior and thus getting swarmier and swarmier queens as you go along? Let me take the last question first. The answer is yes, but I'd like to show you show me some colonies that never ever swarm. Uh, having said that, as I said earlier, you can always go in and remove that queen that you've used for um, the, the swarm cell to make a new nuke and replace her with something. So uh, if your swarming season is in April and May or early into June, then sometime in June or July, once that queen has established the colony, you can requeen uh, the colony and put a new queen in from some genetic stock or uh, buy somebody's uh, queen or uh, queen cell or virgin queen to install there. Uh, maybe you at that point you'll be proficient enough in your own queen rearing that you use one of your own queens. Um, what was the other question? Uh, collecting and freezing the royal jelly and then also the uh, just if you're selecting for, for a swarmy yeah, queen. I, I, I keep forgetting that most people don't know that you can buy uh, frozen royal jelly. Uh, don't buy the stuff that's not frozen because it's probably lost all of its nutritive value. And if you're going to spend the money, um, get frozen organic royal jelly. Now I know this is all stuff from China, but um, you can you can buy it. Or as somebody suggested, there's a question here ask, can you use your own? And I said absolutely. You can just uh, uh, find a tight uh, fitting glass container that you can squeeze the royal jelly out, uh, take the larvae out uh, at the point about a day before the queen cells are, are being uh, closed up. So that would be, well, you don't know your ages, but you know you could cut out some of the queen cells you've got and, uh, and use that for royal jelly for priming the cells. And that would be good and hopefully pure uh, royal jelly without any chemical contaminants in it. Thanks. I have a, a couple of questions. Larry, about some of the, con uh, there was a little bit of confusion about the timing. And, and if in just sort of one or two sentences, if you can sort of just real quick say, okay, on, on day one you do this, day two you do this, day three you do this, just to sort of clarify, I guess sort of a, a summary of, of the, the starter, the grafter, the finisher, the transferring of ripe uh, cells, etc. Okay. Well, uh I guess the question is, everybody's got to ask themselves, how old is this bee right here? And the answer is, it's somewhere between three and four days old. Um, because it's been three days as an egg. So here's an egg, here's an egg. So uh, whether they're workers or queens or drones, they spend three days as eggs. And when the egg hatches, and actually just the, the, the chorion, the shell on the egg softens, 
then you've got a your your three day plus. So this is what you're going to put into the cell cups. Let me go back. Under cell cups. This is what you're going to graft or transfer. And by the way, there are other systems. So you're going to put these in these these cups here. And go into the starter. So this is in the third day. So the next day, you're going to take the bees out of the starter. So here we are. We, we, we grafted last night. So 10 o'clock in the morning, you run home from work on a coffee break, uh, put on your suit and your, your latex gloves, come out to move the graft. So the larvae now in those cells are in their, uh, they've gone three days as eggs, and now you've got uh, one day as larvae, so they're in the second day in the larval stage. And they're going into your finisher colony, these colonies right here. So uh, they're going to stay there for 10 days. So we're at 14 days, 4 plus 10. And the bees that are in that starter, by the way, I forgot to tell you, they just go back to the hive they, can, they, they come from. Repeat that. Uh, the bees that are in the starter go back to the colony they were shaken from. The bees in this finisher colony, that is all one colony. That's all one unit. And you're just going to constantly rotate brood up there. And I get into that the queen rearing essentials point. Uh, but the cells that you've got are going to be, uh, they're going to go, total development for the queen is five and a half days. So here we're probably at uh, four and a half days in the development of these cells. Or they're about to be sealed. And then another six days, six, nine days. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm confusing myself now. Total development time for queens is 15 to 16 days. So 10 days in that starter, on the 10th day, they've either got to be used or caged because on the 11th day, uh, these cells are going to start to emerge and the virgin queens will come out and kill the rest of the cells. That's why you have to learn to count. So these cells right here are, uh, while they're probably still young, they can be caged, and there are cages out there that you can put them into. Did that answer the question? One, la one last question for you, Larry, because we, we've been here uh, uh, over an hour now, and, and I know it's a busy time, and I value your time. But uh, have, uh, how uh, there's a question about a, a cloak board. Um, and how best uh, to use that? How, how is a cloak board incorporated into queen rearing, I guess? Well, in, in many ways, the cloak board does what I've just explained, except it uses one colony to do both operations. And having never used one, again, I'm, I like my system, and I, I know I can teach it. Um, so you asked me to talk about the cloak board, talk to someone like Sue Colby. But basically, as I understand it, you create that, that starter-like condition. Above uh, the colony, they're confined. You put your graft in there, so they've got the emergency response and so forth. And then you pull out a, a drawer, and there's underneath that drawer is a queen excluder. And now the bees from below can come up and mingle, so the, the bees in that the top unit can mingle. It can mix. Um, my friend John Kivas in France uses a cloak board and is, you know, converted to that system. I'm not saying they're bad or there's anything wrong with them. They may be exactly where I should be going. I, I don't know. But uh, like everything else in the beekeeping business, uh, once you get something working, it's nice to keep it working. So we may play with one in the, in the next few months. I'm not sure. So. Um, if you've got a good teacher for the cloak board system, go for it. Um, well, we've we've now gone over uh, an hour and twenty minutes, um, so I'd like to uh, to uh, just thank you very much, Larry, again for taking some time uh, and sharing this information uh, with us. I think small scale queen rearing, uh, backyard queen rearing. Uh, whatever you'd like to call it. I guess it depends on who you are and what you're doing. 
uh, I think is one area of the beekeeping industry that we can uh, really make a tremendous impact on the overall success in beekeeping. Um, well, I, I believe, absolutely. And, and it, what, what amazes me is that queen production in this country all evolved in the northern states. And because of the early season moved south uh, probably 100 years ago. But all the really famous people that started this business in, in raising queens were northern beekeepers. Now, that's not to say there's anything wrong with raising queens in the south. But for someone like myself, if I were in North Carolina next to you, Shane, I'd probably be interested in raising North Carolina queens. Um, I have friends in Texas and Tulsa, Oklahoma, and all kinds of places that are trying to do the same thing. So why don't we just all have our own queen production system and become self-reliant on queens and then ultimately packages and try to work on a stock that's got some natural resistance to uh, whatever it is that you've got in your neighborhood besides varroa. Varroa mites being a number one, but certainly there are other conditions there. And you know, if a colony dies over the winter here in Michigan, well, we know it's not going to be in the breeding program. So I guess that's good news, maybe the only good news about a dead colony. Um, so there's a lot of interest in this. I think that uh, the time is right for bee clubs and individual beekeepers to look at this and be very serious about raising their own queens. And a final comment, I teach a lot of these classes. And I figure, OK, I need to have beekeepers and have, oh, three, four years experience raising bees, just general beekeepers. And frequently, they bring uh, a child, uh, a husband, a wife, uh, a buddy, somebody along who doesn't know anything about bees, or has just started with bees. They're in their first year of beekeeping. And they take off. And they're as good a queen producer as anybody. So. I think we, we tend to fool ourselves. It's all about our mental attitude in doing these things. And we can't get hung up on all the details. The queen rearing is basically very simple. It's all the ancillary stuff that you, know, you hear about that gets complicated. Shane, how many people we got here tonight? Oh, just a handful. <laughs> Um, I, I think a lot of people do get uh, get bogged down in in a lot of the the details of queen rearing, and and that's why something like this is uh, is is um, really useful for folks. And uh, again, Larry, I, I I can't thank you enough. And you're on the hook now, just so you know. Based on the poll at the beginning of this thing, you're on the hook for doing preparing nukes for overwintering later on in the season. And so you and I will get in touch uh, on that and plan a date, and we'll let July. people know. We'll have to do this in July. That would be a good time to do it. And, right. and, and we'll plan on that. Thank you very much. You all have a wonderful evening, and we'll see you next time. All right, and thank you all for being good, a good, list, good bunch of listeners.